GOP. And not for the journal, that's good. I took the question. Sorry. And nature, and nature, sir. Uh, and but most, I think, important from my perspective is, is that uh, Dr. Strachman has a wide, amazing diversity of interests, which makes one of the most curious columns that I have ever written on. And just give you a flavor, I just I should mention only three papers with different perspectives, and dealing with the most important problems in our society. And the first one is interesting because I think it's related to some to uh, the uh, Dr. James here. <laughs> so the, 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 that's the title I did not have read it yet, but that's the title that's really intriguing the most. Very important issue: racial bias of sports medical staff perceptions of our pain. This is an amazing thing I look forward to reading. That's the top of my of my of my list. Then there is this. I want you to do partnership and organization undermine the impact of the sample consensus method about climate change, which seems to be a very extraordinarily important topic. And, and the other one, which is a bit we've discussed so many times in our in the core seminar, which is this is a really topic, is framing public opinion in competitive democracy, which how many groups did you have in that paper? Yeah. 17? <laughs> 17, 17. <laughs> Uh, an amazing study must be for many of us, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I should just before I, I let Professor Dr. present, I should mention that there, there is the one one important shortcoming in the publication. And, 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 and you, you know, <laughs> there is absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> this is this is I think this is not, I can understand how it is. But I think this is going to change. I think that the conversation yesterday, and you acknowledge that this is a thing. I expect to read a very important paper on tennis in the next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so I'm not on Twitter, so this was an interesting experience to even find this. Um, so this was with Donald Trump, and, and he tweeted, um, LeBron James was just interviewed by the dumbest man on television, Don Lemon, who is a host of CNN, and CNN, who basically a show is to criticize Donald Trump. Um, he made LeBron look smart, which isn't easy to do, I like Mike. Um, and so this might not stand out as a particularly kind of distinctive quote in, in many ways, but there, there's a lot in that quote that, that I want to talk about in the kind of theme I want to get to. Um, and specifically, the, the part of the quote which is intriguing and, and kind of interesting to me, which stood out to me, was he made LeBron look smart, which isn't easy to do. So LeBron is dumb. Um, I like Mike. So he likes, so Michael Jordan's okay and LeBron James is, is not okay. And so for those of you who are uh, American basketball fans, you might know a bit about this. Um, so Michael Jordan, right, so these are two, I, probably everybody in the room knows these are two of the greatest basketball players of all time. And Michael Jordan was, was famous or perhaps infamous for not taking any political stance. Um, so he did a very alleged quote, so I looked into the history of this and it's alleged he has never admitted to actually saying this, but there was a, a Senate race in, in 1990 between a, a fairly openly racist um, incumbent, Jesse Helms, who was running against the uh, African-American challenger, and Michael Jordan is from North Carolina, and they really wanted Michael Jordan to endorse the, the African-American challenger, and he refused to do that, and he allegedly said, Republicans buy sneakers too. Um, and so, he, 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 in recent years, in retirement, he's become a bit more political, but he was famously non-political. Um, and this contrasts really quite starkly with LeBron James, 
um, who's, who's usually used his platform as a basketball player to take a lot of political, make a lot of political statements in the fact when recently he was told, there was a commentator who told him he was making political statements and they, she said, you should just shut up and dribble. And his response was, I will not shut up and dribble. I, I get to sit up here and talk. I'm more than an athlete. And so there's a lot in the quote insofar as, as Trump is suggesting that um, there's a, he likes Michael Jordan better, who is a quiet minority, versus LeBron James, who is not being a quiet minority. And so there's a lot about racial threat in that quote that I'm going to get back to. So I'm going to refer back to that um, for quite a, quite, quite a few times through the talk. Um, and so what the talk is, so the, the talk that I'm, I'm, I'm presenting is the intersection of racial and partisan discrimination. And you can see kind of where, where that's coming from, from that, that quote and so far as there's a bit of racial, there's a racial element to that tweet as well as a partisan element. It's not partisan per se, but it's political element to that tweet. So the paper is, is co-written with a, a PhD student at Northwestern named Richard, Richard Schaffer, Um And so um, I'm going to go through, well, let me, let me, let me start. I'm going to go through by starting talking about three different trends that have been going on in the U.S. and in a bit kind of around the world. And then kind of tie these trends to the questions that we're going to ask. And then I'm going to go through a bunch of literatures that motivate some of the hypotheses that we have. And then I'll, I'll talk about those that you know. Um, so one trend, which, which everybody's familiar with, is what, what has happened in terms of what we think of the other parties, at least in, in the U.S. And I've talked with some of you about how these trends carry over to other countries and um, to the extent they carry over to other countries. So this is just a typical thermometer that is asked, um, what, what do you think of the other party? And so when you look at Republicans, right, they like Republicans well enough, and they really don't like Democrats. And you look at Democrats, and they like Democrats well enough, and they really don't like Republicans. In fact, I've mentioned to a few of you that the modal response now on this question in the American National Election Study in 2016, the, the modal response for Democrats for Republicans was zero. The modal response for Republicans and Democrats was zero. And so you really see this trend towards partisan polarization. And in fact, if you chart this over time, this was a, um, a figure that was in a 2018 science order by, by Bostel and colleagues. And you can see political polarization over time in the United States is really just almost monotonically increased. And so you kind of see this one trend of, of, of increased polarization in, in the US. And so that's the, the reference from that paper. Um, the other trend that you see, so what this graph, this is a graph that's a little bit hard to see. This is perceptions of racial discrimination over time. So this is an actual discrimination or perceptions of racial discrimination. And the dark lines are African American perceptions and the, the dotted lines are white American perceptions. And what you see is you see, I couldn't find the perfect graph at this point. What you see, this is only 2008. I'm going to put up the next figure going into 2015. But what you see is you see fairly high levels, at least amongst African Americans, of perceived discrimination, right? About 75% perceived discrimination by police um, on the job. You have about 55%. And then if you extend it, there's some increase in perceived discrimination. But if you extend this out to 2016, I couldn't find data from these same questions for the intermittent years, but then I did find data from just 2016. And so this is the 2016 data. And so this is, I showed you before I mentioned dealing with the police, and what you see is, is African Americans in 2016, it was 84% perceived discrimination. And in, um, in 2008, it was 75%. So you see an increase in that perception. And even amongst whites, I shouldn't even say even amongst, because it's fairly clear in the US, but you see a jump from 35% perceived discrimination against African Americans by police, and a jump to 50%. In the workplace, the figure jump from 12% to 22% whites perceiving their discrimination, and 56% to 64%. So it's another it's another trend that you seem to be happening in the United States, where you're seeing increased perceptions of discrimination going on. And then a final trend that I want to mention is just the changing demographics of, of, of the United States. And again, this is something that's happening worldwide. And so one of the things that's being discussed quite a bit now is as they project out from the census, when they project out from the US census, whites should become a minority, and so they won't have an absolute majority by about 2055 or so. Um, and so this is causing a lot of discussion because what is this going to mean in terms of how whites perceive themselves and are they you know, threatened by these types of trends? And so it's, a, it's another trend that's kind of happening all simultaneously. So what we have is we have these kind of three trends going on in the United States, and then again, in, very extensive in other countries. And one question is, what are all these trends? What do they mean for political outcomes? What do they mean for how politics affect um, political decisions and social decisions? And so some of the big questions that I'm not going to answer today, 
if these are some of the big questions that I think really are, are raised by you look at these trends, do, do these increasingly political polarized attitudes generate discrimination based on partisanship in different domains? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that, but are the trends leading to this? Um, as racial discrimination increased, so I showed you perceived racial discrimination, what if we chart actual discrimination? <coughs> and then have, have the change in projected demographics stimulated increased threat and hence discrimination by the majority group? So one of the theories that I'll, I'll talk about is a group threat theory or racial threat theory, where when you start to feel that you're no longer going to be a majority group, you feel threatened by that, and you start to, to form discriminate, you start to discriminate against the incoming outgroups. And so those are kind of big questions. And so what I'm going to do today is not, I wish I could answer all these questions. Um, that would be pretty phenomenal. Um, I'm not going to do that. Um, and, and hopefully it's fairly clear that any of these would be problematic for democratic functioning and inequality if any of these types of discrimination are happening. When we try to think about a democracy and the basis on which people have equal opportunity, um, these would be problematic. Should, should go without saying. And so what we're gonna, what we do in this study, um, I, I don't look at anything over time, so I can't answer that. I, in a way I felt like I'm deceiving you a little bit, I'm showing you these time trends and then I'm not doing anything over time. So I can't say anything over time. But it is, I, I wanted to start with those trends insofar as it really led me to think about this topic because I've kind of noticed these different trends going on and it kind of led me to think about things in a different way even at one point in time. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at, um, I'm going to go through studies of partisan discrimination, studies of racial discrimination, and discrimination against minority partisans. And I'm going to go through these different theories and then I'm going to show you how we tested these three different possibilities in one study. Um, and in that study, Oh, I should make clear too. So when I say discrimination, what I mean is one group is advantaged relative to another. So this is different than prejudicial attitudes. This is where all is constant. One group is advantaged versus another group based only on the membership to that given group. And so that's what I mean by discrimination. I think it's a fairly common definition if you talk to sociologists at least my understanding of it. And where I'm going to study this, so before I start going through these large literatures, which I'm going to try to summarize in fairly extensive fashion, is the context in which I study this is, is, I think, an intriguing one. So we're going to study this in a higher education setting. Um, and that's a really kind of interesting setting to look at these types of trends. Um, insofar as in, in the US, um, there's been lots of discussions about race, racial and ethnic diversity in higher education settings. Um, this goes back for a long time when we talk about arguments against desegregation, but even then today about kind of the use of race as a factor in admissions decisions. And so even just in July, the um, Department of Education, the Department of Justice, rescinded a policy that allowed consideration of race in decisions at public universities. And then some of you in the room have probably been following this case, which I think is wrapping up today or on Monday, um, it's Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, where it's a lawsuit that was brought against Harvard, and I think there's going to be one against Yale shortly, um, where they, they thought they were holding Asian Americans to a higher standard. And so that was kind of a, an unfair type of reverse discrimination, I guess. But the implications for the lawsuit could be in using any racial or ethnic criterion um, in making admissions decisions. So this is the higher education setting to kind of think about racial and ethnic discrimination is kind of an important one to think about. And then if you think about politics, um, there's a lot of discussion about political diversity in academic settings. Um, there's often a common claim that there's a liberal overrepresentation and discrimination against conservatives in higher education settings. Um, at least it's a fairly common claim in the U.S. I think it's probably a common claim in kind of in any country. Um, and then if you ask Americans, 61% of Americans think higher education is moving in the wrong direction, um, which is a very high amount. But then if you break it down, they have very different concerns, right? So 79, the top worry of, some, of for Republicans, 79% of them are worried about professors introducing political and social views in the classroom, um, whereas Democrats, the larger concern is about higher tuition. Um, so again, uh, what I'm going to kind of come back to higher education. That's the context in which I'm going to con we conduct the empirical study, which you'll see what we do in, in a little bit. But what I'm going to do um, before I come back to that, or I should say what we actually focus on. So what we focus on is we actually, so we carried out a study. So as I go through these literatures and come up with hypotheses, I'm hypothesizing what we study is informational requests from prospective applicants to four-year colleges and graduate schools. And so specifically what we're interested in and so, so, you're a, so imagine that yourself, you're a high school junior and you're trying to gather information on where you might go to college and you would likely send an email to some of these colleges to get information. And so what we're interested in is how do these different factors, racial, partisan, the intersection of racial and partisan factors, how do they affect the likelihood that you're actually even going to get a request to this response? Okay? And so there is the, a matter that you might raise immediately, do the requests matter? Like, does it actually matter if you're responding to or not? Because 
is that really going to deter you from applying to that school or possibly going to the school? And I, I can't answer that. Um, it, it seems plausible to me that if you don't get a response, it could vitiate the potential interest of an applicant. Perhaps the flip side is more important when you do get a response, is that likely to stimulate kind of interest in that? And I can actually speak to that from my own life experience. Right now, I have a actually a 17 year old son who is just applying to colleges and getting some notifications back. And he just got an email yesterday from one of the schools that he was accepted. And I have to tell you, I started to like the school a lot more when there was <laughs> when we saw got a personal communication. At the school. Um, perhaps I was just engaged in motivated reading to study or something. But but even Regardless of that, I, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting domain to study social decision making because we're taught, and I, I, I won't be able to speak to the extent to which any of these are conscious or unconscious decisions, but they're kind of daily decisions that the people who are receiving these emails and requests for information, this is part of their daily tasks. They work in admissions offices and they're getting these emails and they have to make a decision which ones to respond to. And in that sense, it's kind of a common decision making thing that goes on. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I deal with admission and I just have a can. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in the details of the study. Um, so, yeah, come, when, when I get to the actual study, you can feel free to raise that again if I'm not interested in it enough. Um, and so, so yeah. Um, so, but that was definitely something on our mind. I guess the, the quick response is so you keep paying attention and don't stop. <laughs> so, we, to the extent that you have a canned email, you still are making a decision to respond or not respond now. And so we, we, we're not interested in auto responses. So any, where there's an automatic response, that's discounted. So there had to be, we're interested in, there had to be some human, at least as far as we can tell, who was making a decision, conscious or unconscious, but some decision to actually respond to the email. So there had to be, there was actually, it wasn't an automated response. Um, perhaps it's automated for you, but, um, so we'll, we'll um, see. So there are, there have been some related studies kind of topically on this. So, um, there's actually a, a working paper by a, a couple of graduate students um, that they find there are fewer responses to the same types of information requests when a criminal record is mentioned. And so that's kind of an interesting finding. Um, there was a study that requests to professors for meetings received less response when sent from a Chinese sounding name versus an Anglo sounding name. So this was a request for office hours and they were much less likely to get a response, a positive response that the professor would meet with you um, if there was a Chinese sounding name versus an Anglo sounding name. Um, there's um, a study that's coming out in a, in, by John Carey and some colleagues where they did a conjoint experiment and hypothetical um, faculty hiring, and they found no minority discrimination in these hypothetical hiring decisions. Um, and then there is a, um, a, a bit of a literature on partisan discrimination in hypothetical decision making amongst faculty. So there, um, this has particularly been in psychology because there's particular concern in psychology about liberal bias, so there have been these studies that shows that there is partisan discrimination where people are less likely to accept the paper if it comes from a conservative, they're less likely to admit a hypothetical applicant who's conservative, and they're less likely to hire a conservative colleague. Um, actually, this paper was across disciplines, um, but a lot of that work had been in psychology. So that's some, some related studies. Um, so what I'm gonna do from here, now that you kind of have the general motivation, what was leading me to kind of ask these questions, and hopefully you see some time to affect the polarization, because a lot of this is about there's this increase in ostensible polarization, and how much is that kind of spilling over into decisions that are non-political decisions? And so I'm going to try to summarize these three enormous literatures to ger generate hypotheses. So I'm obviously going to be generalizing quite a bit, but I'm going to go through some work on racial discrimination and decision making, political discrimination and decision making, racial threat and decision making. Then I'll get to the experiment that we conducted. I'll show you the results. I'm going to show you the results of Another experiment we conducted, but I've only just looked at the data this week, so it's just tentative at this point. And then I will open up the discussion and maybe you can kind of get to some of these larger questions. Um, so racial discrimination and decision making. Obviously, this is a really large literature to kind of undertake a review of, so I'm just going to highlight the general findings and some examples of that. And the, the general finding in the American context is that African Americans generally receive are, are discriminated against in a, in a host of domains. So there, there's actually a huge literature on medical treatment, and they Generally speaking, African Americans receive lower quality medical treatment. So this is a kind of a seminal paper. African Americans are seen as left as 50% more likely to not comply with medical advice, for example. This was actually a, a, the study that, uh, that Andre mentioned um, that I had been involved with college athletic trainers see Af African American students as 8% more pain tolerant, which becomes problematic because then they are less likely to prescribe the necessary drugs to deal with pain. Um, and that's another outcome thing that we looked at. Um, African Americans are um, likely to get fewer employment opportunities, so there have been 
probably more than 100 of these kinds of studies where they send out job applications from people of different racial ethnic groups. There was a meta-analysis of these, of 50 of these studies um, by my colleague at Northwestern in sociology, Lincoln Cullian, and they found African-American mean job applicants who have 36% fewer callbacks for actual interviews than compared to comparable white candidates. Um, just to add on a few more examples, these were kind of interesting papers I thought people would be interested to hear about. This is a recent paper I came across about Airbnb, where they did an experiment where they sent out Airbnb requests, and African-American guests were 16% less likely to be accepted relative to identical white guests in their Airbnb applications. And then there's um, some of you might be um, familiar with this literature. This is a literature that started in 2011 with a paper by um, Butler and Brockman, where they sent out requests to state legislators for information about voting, and they varied whether the request came from a white sounding um, person or an African American sounding person. In that initial study, um, I think they found about 11% less response. There have not been over 50 such of these studies. So this has been, I was pretty shocked too that it's been done over 50 times. And this was a meta analysis of these studies. Um, that was in the Journal of Experimental Political Science. And overall, African Americans um, versus two white representatives were 7% less likely to receive a response relative to non minority constituents. There's actually more of a discrimination against Latino um, constituents that they found in the community. Um, so that leads to a fairly straightforward racial discrimination hypothesis, which is that relative to whites, African Americans will be less likely to receive information when they write up for this kind of information on the college, they'll be less likely to receive information upon request. Due to their race, all else constant. So holding everything else constant, they will get less response. So that's that's one hypothesis that we're we're looking at. Um, so then there's another literature on partisan discrimination decision making. And the, the idea of this literature, which a lot of you have probably seen bits and pieces of at least, is that political bias spills over into non-political settings. That is, we use what we know about somebody politically to make judgments about them in other otherwise, or perhaps we're just discriminatory against for political reasons, and that might lead to fewer opportunities. So for example, out partisans, meaning in the US context for a Republican, the out partisan is a Democrat. So out partisans receive um, fewer employment opportunities. So there was a study which was a similar to a job market study, like the ones I referred to with race. This one looked at partisanship. Out partisans received two and a half to six percent fewer calls for interviews um, than people in parties. So what they did in this study was they looked at a very liberal county and a very conservative county, and then they varied with the applicant mentioned being a Democrat or a Republican. And in the liberal county, if you mentioned being a Democrat, you got about six, I think the liberal county was about 6% fewer callbacks or calls for interviews than, um, than if you mentioned no partisanship. Um, conservatives are 7% less likely to be offered a hypothetical academic job. I kind of intimated that finding before. Um, there's lower charges in everyday economic transactions. So this was a, a fairly interesting paper that recently a, a, appeared in the EJPS. Um, where they asked people to, if they, they wanted, they actually used mechanical turf workers, which was a, a neat use of mechanical turf workers because for the, many of you might know mechanical turf was actually not invented for people to do surveys, but for them to actually do jobs, like, like transcribing audio tapes and things. So they asked people if they would do an editing job, and then they asked them what they would charge for this editing job, and the people were, they charged six and a half less if the person came from their political party. So they were actually charging less money. So if, if I'm a Democrat and I'm gonna do an editing job for somebody, I'm gonna charge another Democrat less than the Republican for the same exact job. And so that's a bit of, of partisan discrimination in the marketplace. Um, here are hypothetical um, college applications. So I kind of intimated this line before too, but in this hypothetical choice, um, more than 50% opted for a weaker applicant if the stronger applicants support the other party's presidential candidate. Um, so this was a paper that if you're interested, it was in, I think, JPSP. Um, and fewer offers to collaborate. So 54, so this was, a, they did a, a, a behavioral game experiment where you could make money if you worked with people who were really good at solving these puzzles. And so they would represent the people you could choose from to be on your team to solve these puzzles. And people were 54% declined to collaborate with clearly more qualified out partisans who were gonna help them win this money because they were out partisans. So again, you're seeing all these cases of partisan discrimination. So how would that apply in a, in a higher education study? Um, so this is, uh, give me a second before you come to any conclusion. Um, so it's often asserted, as I mentioned, that academic settings lead to the left of the Democratic Party. If you go with that presumption, that would lead to the hypothesis that, a part of the discrimination hypothesis, that relative to nonpartisans, Democrats will be more likely and Republicans will be less likely to receive information upon request due to their partisan affiliations all its constant. So that would lead to a partisan discrimination hypothesis. If we accept this hypothesis that there's this liberal bias in academia, that might be a problematic presumption um, 
especially because you know, in our study, as I've suggested, we're looking more at administrators than, than academics. Um, so, so we are going to explore that. So before you kind of dismiss this other hand, we are going to try to get a proxy to get at the partisanship of the person responding. So you, you could see partisan discrimination in any direction. But this is where we're going to start when we look at the data. Um, so I'm going to start with that. So the final literature I'm going to turn to, oh no, I'm sorry, there's another uh, a literature that kind of spun off of the political discrimination literature, and this is just an aversion of politics literature. And the idea here isn't necessarily that you discriminate against somebody because they're a Democrat or a Republican, but you discriminate them against them because they don't like politics at all. Um, and again, I can speak to this from my own experience. So both, for whatever reason, both of my kids never want to talk about politics. So <laughs> as soon as I bring up politics, their eyes glaze over and they leave the room. Um, and so um, here, and, and, and kind of the, the most interesting work on this is a book by um, um, Samara Klar and Yana Kutnikov. Um, they found 40% expressed discontent working with a politically active colleague, even if they're from the same party. So even if they're from the same party, they don't want to work with somebody who's politically active. 20% um, are less happy if their child marries an out partisan who frequently discusses politics. So there's this, this finding that people don't like it when their child marries somebody from the out party. They're actually not that upset if that person is not that politically engaged. But when they become politically engaged, you don't want to deal with an out partisan who's politically engaged. Um, <laughs> And then there was this, I don't know how many people have seen this, this was a pretty fascinating use of, they used geocoding data from phones, and they were able to kind of isolate who would be more or less likely to be in eating their Thanksgiving dinner um, at, in a politically divided environment. And they found that politically divided, where that was likely, politically divided family short Thanksgiving dinner by 20 to 30 minutes following the 2016 election, which was a very polarized election versus the 2015 election. Um, so it was something got, I, used, I had it up there and I took it up, but the, the number of aggregate minutes lost of conversation, though, was, you know, it's like hundreds of millions of minutes, because you aggregate this over the number of things giving dinner at the individual level. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fascinating page. So this was a paper that appeared in Science. Um, so I think there's a lot of controversy about how they use the data, but it's a pretty intriguing thing to, to kind of think about as we head into Thanksgiving um, as well. Um, and so the hypothesis here would be um, that any mention of politics, interest in politics, Democrat, Republican, um, regardless of, so regardless of the partisan connotation, will lower the likelihood of response at all since people are averse, they don't want to engage in political discussion. So that would be a, a third hypothesis, again, kind of within this domain of political spillover of hypotheses. So then the final literature I'm going to turn to is this um, fairly good-sized old literature on minority group threat or racial threat theory. And so this comes they're, they're slightly different theories, but I'm going to kind of use them similarly. And the idea here is that um, prejudice occurs due to a perception by the dominant group that an outside group threatens their group's pejoratives. And, and, um, um, so this was kind of what I'm getting at with the, the, the tweet that I put up at the, at the beginning. And so the, the classical paper on this was by Bloomer in 1958, and then um, Blaylock wrote a book about this in 1967. And the idea is that these threats can come in various guises. They can be economic threats, political threats, or symbolic um, value-based threats. The, again, the idea here is that this has applied, been applied kind of most famously in the case of immigration, where you're kind of worried about immigrants moving in, and that's going to challenge your economic well-being, it's going to challenge your values, or it's going to challenge your politics, and you're going to come to not like that group very much. You're going to kind of feel threatened by that, that group. And so um, what you see in this literature, again, just selected findings, is that um, as economic conditions were so minority groups face a greater discrimination as economic conditions worsen and the relative size of the immigrant group grows. So again, you see the size of the immigrant population grows and you see um, more discrimination. Um, you also, there's this literature now that coming back to that graph I put up at the beginning about the changing population, at the projected size of the minority group is high, you see increasing discriminatory attitudes. So even when you show, so what these, um, what these people did, there's psychologists, they showed people just the projections of the census, basically the graph that I put up about the changing face of America. If you show people that graph, they become more conservative and they become more discriminatory in their racial and, and immigration attitudes. Um, this is a paper that people might know from political science by Ryan Enos, that as the actual size of the group changes, that actually can reduce threat. So he showed kind of the inverse, he showed the displacement of a minority group, and that actually decreased voting turnout because the idea was that people felt less threatened. Um, and then um, a final, which is, I just came across this study after we had done our, our study, but it's very similar to what we did in a, in a way, as you'll see, is a minority African-American who writes to get information from colleges along the lines of what we're going to do, 
um, who mentions caring about anti-racism and racial ju injustice is less likely to get response um, to, the, to their requests. So that's a, another type of um, racial threat dynamic going on. And so again, the kind of the theory that's going on here is that African-American perspective applicant who mentioned politics of any sort may generate a feeling of threat. So what I'm kind of doing, I'm not, I'm kind of taking this general theory which often focuses on aggregate trends and kind of all, all these aggregate trends, and I'm trying to apply this to a micro decision-making context. So I, I don't know how problematic that this is to people who kind of study these aggregate trends. I've talked to a few of my colleagues who do this, and they don't seem horribly troubled by it. I, I'm, I'm feeling I'm going to get into trouble one of these times when I thought it were. But the, so the idea, though, is if you are a politically engaged minority member, it's going to generate this discomfort because you're going to feel this threat and of displacing the dominant position, and therefore you're going to face more discrimination. So again, along the lines of that initial tweet, that there was discomfort that Donald Trump seemed to be feeling, I'm not going to start to try to psychoanalyze Donald Trump, but this is some kind of discomfort that he felt from LeBron James, who's taking a political stance on different things, versus a Michael Jordan is not a threatening in, in, in a political sense. So, um, and we would expect these things to increase. Again, I'm not going to be able to speak to overtime trends, but you expect this to become a particularly salient possibility as polarization increases because people are going to worry more about their political agendas, and also as demographics change because we start to worry about our dominant position uh, amongst the majority group. And so again, coming back to the tweet, that's kind of what I see going on in, in that tweet. And so the racial threat hypothesis is that relative to an analogous white perspective applicant or an African American who does not mention politics, an African American who mentions politics of any sort will be less likely to receive a response. And so that's, those are the hypotheses. I'm not going to, if anybody has any questions, I'm going to start to move into the actual study. I know that was a lot of lead up, but there was a lot of kind of considerations into, um, in, um, into this, to the study. Are there any questions? Okay. So, the method we use is what's called a correspondence or an audit study, which I, I assume some of you, but maybe not everybody in the room is familiar with. And what it, it's, a, it's an, an approach that's been used to demonstrate uh, discriminations in settings such as housing and labor markets. And so there's a, a fairly sizable literature amongst labor economics and, and sociologists, and again, it's kind of been used most prevalently in political science to study legislative responsiveness. So the study I mentioned before that was first done by Butler and, and, and Brockman. Um, so the, the idea is that it involves a written or electronic submission of fictitious application materials to assess the prevalence of discrimination <coughs> in a given setting. And so basically what you do is the researcher sends out job applications, for example, that are identical except they vary along the key dimensions. So they might vary the race of the applicant, they can vary the age of the applicant if you're looking at ageism discrimination, you can vary the religion of the applicant, you can vary the gender of the applicant. There was a study that varied the, um, if the applicant had a physical disability or not. And so you can gauge if you're getting a different amount of responses based on that one variation because you're keeping everything else constant, then you can conclude that there's some discrimination in the study. Um, that's basically the logic behind these types of studies. Um, perhaps one of the more famous ones was in, in the economic labor market um, by um, Bertrand and Newland. I've never quite known how to pronounce his name perfectly. But they found that white sounding names to fictitious, uh, white sounding names on fictitious resumes you did 50% more callbacks for interviews than comparable resumes which were labeled with African American sounding names. And so that's kind of one of the seminal studies um, in this area. And then I mentioned again the legislative response in this studies. Um, oh, I, I doubled the amount. So Butler and Brockman initially found 5.1% less response. And as I mentioned, there's now been about 50 of these. So when you do these, so I'm going to come back to a second about the ethics of doing this because I think it's something that one has to discuss when they do one of these studies. But again, what we're interested in is information requests from prospective college applicants. And, then, and again, I, I want to be careful about if this is a conscious or unconscious decision making. Because we have no, no idea to think about mechanisms here. I'm going, to, I'm going to end by talking about that a little bit. So there are ethical issues I think you have to talk about. This comes up in this literature because you are engaging in deception and you're, in, and you're doing a study without consent. And I think there's a variety of things you have to think about when you're doing this. Um, one of that is you are doing deception because you're sending out false app, false applications or false inquiries for different things, and you're waiving consent. So you, when you get IRB approval for this, you're getting a waived consent. And the idea here is that it's um, hopefully consistent with what, what Robert Putnam did want to be a study like this, actually, in, um, in um, the first book, Democracy. Does democracy work? Is that, um, make a democracy work, I guess I'm projecting. Um, making democracy work. Um, and, uh, and he, 
you know, his, his standard, I, I think, is a reasonably put. It, it's slightly deceptive, but innocuous and highly informative. So you're kind of making, is this going to be informative enough given the deception that's going on? Um, so that's a question we have to answer. So you do want to ensure anonymity here. Um, you don't want to release individual level data because people may misconstrue what inferences you can draw from a single response. So that's an important thing. You want to think a lot about, about time. So one thing that we thought a lot about before doing this is, you know, we are taking up people's time to be in our study without their consent, and it's distracting from them doing other things. We felt like this was maybe because we, we felt like most people would have a pretty much, they, they respond to these all the time, so it's not like they're going to spend a day doing this. Um, so we're hoping that it was not a lot of time and it was consistent with their other job duties. I think one of the larger ethical considerations here, which I think gets a lot of attention, is the opportunity cost to others. Um, so uh, ostensibly, in, in our context, the opportunity cost is probably not that great. That is, if, if somebody's responding to one person who writes this, it's probably not detracting them from right, responding to another person. I think this is a really big consideration, though, in the job market studies, because if you're calling one person back for a job interview and it's not a real person, there's somebody else who's not going to do that. And so I think that, to me at least, it, I think this is a big ethical question for the job market labor studies. And I know there's been debate about this in that literature. But at the end of the day, we, we did think through these. Um, and our, our kind of, the end, we kind of concluded that the collective benefit of documenting this degree of discrimination um, outweighed um, deception and time cost to participants. And obviously, we did the study, so we concluded that it did. It is an interesting thing, which I don't know a lot about, but IRBs actually on these audit studies are very lax. Um, they're, they're, there's something in the IRB, at least in, in the US, there's something in the IRB code um, that says on these types of audit studies that the criteria they use is much lower um, because I think it's being seen as a way to waive consent. Um, and, and so I'm not sure the history of that is kind of something that's intrigued me that I haven't looked into. Um, so actually, the IRB process for this it was very fast. Um, so, which, which, which surprised me before I, that I had never done an audit study like this before. Um, so, our, our sample, does anybody have any other questions about the method? So, the sample, we got a list of all accredited degree granting colleges and universities in the United States um, that offered at least one bachelor's degree. Um, and we got this list from the National Center for Education Statistics and this was from 2016. And that led to about 2,500. Um, schools, which I thought was a lot, and then we had dinner last night, and I realized that maybe this isn't that much. Um, and uh, apparently, Canada probably has about the same per capita amount of institutions. Um, but it is interesting when you look at the list of institutions. Ninety percent of them are schools that I had never never heard about. Um, so it's it's really kind of a, a fascinating thing to think about because I had never thought about how many schools are are out there. Um, we had a team of students locate the email contacts, so we had them go on the admissions web pages of these of these universities or colleges, get to the, that page and find an email contact for admission inquiries. Um, so we excluded women's, all women's schools, which was, there are not a lot of those left in the United States. Um, the main reason for exclusion was the online contact form. So a fair number of schools, you could not, they, they did not give you an email address to which you could write. They said, if you have a question, you need to fill out this form online. And we opted to not do that for a variety of reasons, well, for two reasons mainly. One was logistically, it would what would have it would would have been very difficult for us because we would have had to go on about 500 school there were about 500 schools that had that and we we just didn't have the logistical power to go on the 500 websites and do this it also would have broken up how we would have been able to do the study because we would have then be contacting it would have been a different mode of communication instead of a direct email I mean it would have been a different timing because I don't think we would have been able to time everything so we done at once um, so we did not include that in our sample um, it's a I do not know. Uh, if those schools look dramatically different from other schools. My sense was that to the extent they can, they were larger schools, right? Because they're they're kind of um, doing this um, in an automated fashion because they, they didn't have they, they're getting so many inquiries. Um, we also excluded ones that there were some duplicate information. So some branch campuses, which were listed as separate campuses in this list, they actually have admissions all through one central um, thing. And then there were a bunch of schools that no longer existed. So when you have that many schools, schools go out of business. So we would look up schools, and there weren't many. Um, and then there was uh, some schools we just couldn't find any contact information. So we ended up with a sample of um, about 1,500 schools. Um, so our, again, our design involved sending an email requesting for more information, um, contact. So we wanted to vary two factors to get at these hypotheses. We wanted to vary race, and we wanted to vary political reference in the content of the email. So to vary race, we followed. Um, what is a fairly large literature now, 
um, where we vary the name. And so the name of the person requesting the information either connoted an African American, or, so we only used males. So this was something we thought a fair amount as well too. At first we thought maybe we vary gender, and then we realized that we'd probably find some effects for gender. And then we started to worry a lot about power, and so we ended up using only males, and, and our rationale for using males was really because the other studies in the partisan polarization literature, so Iyengar's work and the work of the students, they've actually typically always used males as well. And so it's actually an interesting question that there are a lot of these polarization spillover studies have not used females names yet. Just really quickly in your sample, I'm not super familiar, but aren't there schools in the United States that are traditionally geared towards African American like colleges? Yeah, so they would have been in our sample, okay. but randomly assigned to the conditions. But yeah, they would have been there. There is a historically black colleges on the university. I don't know how many of them are are in the union, but it's a it's a non-trivial number, so it's a it's a big question. Um so yeah, so we ended up using males. I think it's actually a really interesting question to look at the partisan spillover literature and look at the intersection of gender. And so the names we use um, were Jabari Washington and Dalton Wood. Um, it's really important in choosing these names. And so it's, there's actually a lot of thought that has to go into choosing these names because you want to make sure that the names are connoting race and not much else. The, one of the major confounds that people have talked about in this literature that uses names is that there's often a confound between socioeconomic status and names. And so to make sure we weren't doing that, what we did is we, I have a, a nifty colleague actually who has the birth records, it's, it's proprietary data, he has the birth records of everybody born in Florida. Um, and so he, he actually can look, and he knows their names, and he knows their race, and he knows their economic standing, and he knows their parental education. And so I always ask him to, to generate names um, for, the, for these types of for other studies I've used. I haven't done audit, but I've used names in other studies. And so the first names we used, Jabari and Dalton, at least in the state of Florida, 90% um, of Daltons were white and 90% of Jabari's were African American, um, and they were all, it was middle class. So these were really useful names to get him to generate and so forth. The respective maternal education for Jabari was 12.56 years and for Dalton it was 12.53 years. So on objective speaking, at least, again, it's Florida, so you can't generalize completely, but at least those names in actuality did not confound class. But then we also, and, and the last names we used, um, we, didn't, we didn't provide you any information about class, but in terms of race, um, Wood is basically an all-white last name. I don't think there, I do think there was one example in his data. Um, and 88% of those with the last name of Washington were African American. But we also then wanted to make sure this aligned with perception, so we did a pretest. We just did a mechanical trick pretest where we gave people the name and we asked them their impressions of the name. So we asked them to consume race. So 92% thought Dalton Wood was white, 92% thought Jamar and Washington was black. We asked for a class standing on a one to five scale, one being lower class, five being upper class, their classes didn't significantly differ from one another. We asked about the likelihood of a parent being born in the U.S. because we didn't want to have confound with immigration status, and there were not a significant difference there. And then we asked about familiarity. We didn't want one name to really stand out as being really unfamiliar, and we didn't find a significant difference there. So we felt fairly good about using these particular names. But given how much work the names are doing in our study, we really wanted to make sure they, they were they were. There's actually, if you're pursuing this, there was actually a really nice article written recently in Political Analysis um, by Dan Butler. And there were a few other authors that talked about how to use names um, to the extent that you're going to use names. And, and he offers some really, they offer some really sound advice. So the other factor we vary aside from race is the political content of the email. So right, what we did is we varied the context where we had four different possibilities. One was there's no mention of politics, but to make sure that there was some um, there was some consistency in what we were talking about. In the, the no politics condition, we, we said the person would, you'll see the actual text in a moment. They were active in a civics club. Then there was a politically engaged person. So this is a not, they're not revealing their political partisanship, but they're active with a club that organizes <coughs> political discussion. So they're interested in politics. Then there's somebody who's active with the young Democrats, and then there's somebody who's active with the young Republicans. And so we varied those things. And so, so otherwise the content was the same. So the content, of the email, um, basically prospective student inquiry, dear, and then we had the name of the school admissions. I'm writing to obtain more information about the school. I'm a high school junior, and I think your school would be a good fit for me. And then I have been in a number of intramural sports in the theater club. Well, I'm also passionate about them. Here's the treatment. The community, I've been active with the civics club. Politics, and have been active with the club that organizes political discussions and debates. Politics, and have been active with the young Democrats or the young Republicans. And then just 
an actual request, could you please contact, connect me with somebody who's an admissions counselor or a currently enrolled student? So we actually wanted to make sure we were asking that we get more information. Otherwise, why would you expect that we would respond? And so we had then eight conditions. So to kind of tie that all together, right, we had the white non political condition, which was all wood and active in a civics club, African American non political, and then down the line, white politically engaged, African American politically engaged, white Democrat, African American Democrat, white Republican, African American. Yeah. In, in real letters, as opposed to yours, is it likely that somebody would mention being a young Democrat or young Republican? Yeah, I asked a bunch of admissions counselors, and they, it's not unheard of. Um, and so they had seen it before. So they, wouldn't be, like, they, they wouldn't say there's something unusual about this letter that meant this person that mentioned. In the people that I spoke to, it didn't stand out to them. So I, I sent it to Northwestern admissions people. And I, I sent it to a variety of different ones. And some of them, I didn't tell them what I was doing. And I said, does it does this strike you as a fairly a, a letter you might get? And the people who got, again, this was not a large, and I couldn't draw any inferences, but nobody kind of said like, oh, that's really weird that I got that. Because the content, right, is that you're saying, you're not just saying I'm a Democrat. You're saying you're, we, we worded it as I've been active. So you're kind of trying to reveal an activity that you've been involved with. Um, so yeah, to the extent that I can draw an inference about that. Um, I just wonder if in Canada, if, if, if it said young liberal or young conservative or young NDP, or it would be unlikely to, to be in such a letter. I would think so, but that's just a guess. I don't know about that. Like, I have a cousin who is, she volunteers for these, like, you know, women in the house, and, like, she volunteers for the Liberal Party, and, like, she would write about that in a letter from her, so, I don't think it's... Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fair question, um, and so, um, yeah, you know, I have to think about all that would that mean for the results, but, um, but yeah. Um, so again, to summarize the hypotheses on uh, racial discrimination, we would expect a lower response from any of the emails that came from the African American. Partisan discrimination, we would expect a lower response from the email from the Republican. Um, I should say a higher response from the Democrats. Um, so, and again, I'm going to come back to that, and we're going to try to kind of address this presumption that there's going to be a that there it's a liberal respondent getting the email. The political engagement hypothesis would be a low response to any emails that mention politics. So at least it doesn't matter how we end up testing this, but in what I'm going to show you, basically any mention of politics shows political engagement. So regardless of if you mentioned just being organizing political debates or Republicans or Democrats, that's showing political engagement. So you should get lower response for being politically engaged. And then the racial threat would be this mix of an, an email from an African American who mentioned politics of any kind. So mentioning being involved in political debates, being a Republican or being a Democrat. And so those are how we're going to test the hypothesis. Yeah. So do you think the non-political engagement as the control group? You know, the one who's just involved in, uh, you know, if you go back to website. Uh, yeah. So is, uh, it is this one, right? Oh, so. You can think of this as a control group. I mean, yeah, we can think of a control, control group in the in the strict sense of the term control group. I mean, so what we're what I'm going to show you is a first. I'm going to show you a regression, basically that that captures each one of these hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, there's going to be a dummy variable for if there was an African American email of any type. And so if that's significant, that would suggest that being an African American, regardless of the content of the email, led to discrimination or a lower response rate. Then there's going to be a variable that um, was there was there an email from were you a Democrat regardless of your race were you, were you a Republican regardless of your race um, and so on down the list. But then I'll also show you the percentages by condition. Um, but yeah, I mean, so there, so so you don't have any uh, condition where there's no engagement at all, even. Well, how would they respond? Right, the email had to come from somebody, right? So we're actually sending a request for information. Yeah, well, I suppose he's... we could have had no name, like a not a name, and no mention of. We had that. Yeah, I suppose we could have. We could have had an a, a, an email coming from somebody who had a very ambiguous name. I suppose. Um, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we didn't have we didn't have a strict control group in that in that sense. So, um, this is the result. Um, so this is the regression. Actually, so I'm glad you asked that um, because 
they've motivated what this regression is showing you. So the dependent variable simply did we get a response? So I should say I should have described a little bit more um, of how I set up the regression. So we, in, in looking at data, sorry, I just want to make a move to these questions. So as I kind of mentioned to Jeff before, we excluded any auto response, so we, we didn't want any auto, we wanted an actual response. Um, we, we, that took a lot of time, actually, because we wanted to really look. Sometimes it was not really clear if it was an auto response or not. We looked at the time of how quickly it came and what the content said. And so we wanted, if it was, time was, a, we used that a lot to see if it was an auto response. We got a few schools that were multiple times. We excluded, we only looked at it if it was the first response. Um, we, we ignored, we were added to mailing lists. You know, I guess I'm, I'm trying to say when we opened the email accounts after we launched the study, it was a mess. Um, there was just like a billion different things going on. So we had to kind of sort through all of this. So we had two people sort through each account to make sure they were coming to the same conclusion of what was a real response and not a real response. And so um, the regression again is just, do we get that real response? And so what you see is there was not, no racial discrimination going on in this setting. There was no discrimination against Democrats, Republicans, the political mention, but you see a fairly large negative effect. So when the email came from an African-American, Jabari in this case, mentioned politics, either organizing political debates, being a Democrat or being a Republican, you see a fairly large decline kind of in the likelihood response. Um, and so specifically, um, the average response rate when it was not an African American sending an email referring to politics was about 75%. So generally speaking, we got a pretty good response rate. People generally responded. Um, but the Average response rate when it came from an African American um, referring to politics um, was 65 or 66 percent. Um, so you see about an eight and a half percent difference from from those two different groups. Um, so in terms of how big of an effect size is that? So it's, it's actually kind of sensible in retrospect that it's actually pretty similar to the size of the impact of race on the political responsiveness studies. Insofar as those legislative responsiveness studies. They're looking at just race, but they're looking at it in an explicitly political request. And so in that sense, it's actually kind of reassuring um, in terms of the soundness of this result in that they're finding a fairly similar size effect in terms of when somebody went in a race in a political domain. Um, it's dramatically smaller than the race effect in job interview studies. So as I kind of mentioned before, that kind of the meta-analysis found 36% difference um, between just African, there's no political component in these studies. And so in terms of the effect size, it's similar to that, but nowhere near as large as, as these, these rates of best. And so if we look, you can ask the question kind of getting that, like, is this going, is there one condition that's driving this? Was this all the African-American Republican condition? And it turns out in this context, for the undergraduates, um, oh, you know, I was going to mention, I jumped ahead. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. We put in other controls. So we were able to get um, other um variables measures of some of the observations. So about 75% of the schools in the sample were able to get information about the schools from this uh, integrated post-secondary education data system, which provides information about schools, but it excludes schools with open enrollment or that don't participate in federal student financial aid programs, which was about 25% of our sample. So when we put in for the 75% of the sample that we had those data, um, this is not that surprising, but when the con most of the contact emails that we wrote to were just admissions at Montreal.edu, um, but some of them were personal, actual people. So the instructions in getting emails, try to use the admissions emails, but if you couldn't find that on the web page, then find the director of admissions and use that email. When it went to an actual person, that increased the response rate, which you would expect because it's a more of a personal response. As the size of the school increased, it increased the response rate, which we presume to mean that they're just, they have a system set up to respond to these types of um, inquiries because they're such large schools. Higher graduation rates um, led to more responsiveness, which again we assume kind of reflects that there's more investment in kind of student kind of enhancement type services. And then we also find higher response rate in the Northeast and the Midwest um, as opposed to the South and the West. Um, and um, I'm not sure what to infer from the, the regional findings. Um, I, we looked at more smaller regions I can talk about. I don't know how interesting that is about the larger picture here. Um, so if I come back to looking at by condition, what you see is that there, there wasn't one condition that was driving this. Basically, in all of the African-American political conditions, all of them were 65% of some sort. Uh, in fact, we got the same exact response rate 
in the politically engaged in the Democrat position. And so there wasn't one condition that was driving this. It wasn't just African American Republicans, which is one thing that you may have thought at first, and I'm going to come back to that actually in a little bit. Um, and the other conditions um, were all fairly similar. At least there were no significant differences. So you might see here, it looks like there's a slightly higher response rate for African American non political. It's not a significant difference. Um, it's moving in that direction. Or um, here you can see. There's a bit of a higher response rate for the white Democrat than the white politically engaged, but again, that's not a significant um, difference. So um, let me come back to this assumption that I brought up. So we, we, we assumed here that respondents mean Democratic, and that might be a pretty weak assumption. And so what we did to, to, to get at that is we got the, the county level partisan meaning of, uh, from where the school sits. So a school is in a certain county, and then we got the partisanship of that county. And so we were able to then use that as a very rough proxy for what is the likelihood of the partisanship of the responder or the culture of the school. Um, and so this is the same approach that the study I mentioned before on political spillover and job markets used the county of the partisanship. And so what we did to look at that is we used 2016 Clinton vote share measure in the model. And so basically, as that, as that goes up, we assume that it's more likely that the respondent is coming from a school or the respondent him or herself is more likely to be a Democrat. So what you should see then if there's partisan, this is most relevant for partisan discrimination, you should see an interaction between um, Clinton vote share and Democratic requests in a positive direction, and then Clinton vote share and Republican requests in a negative direction. Does that make sense to everybody? So what we found when we added this, well, I guess I just said we're looking at these interactions. So this was the, this was the regression we already saw. So we found some evidence for a partisan discrimination hypothesis. Um, this is not super, super, super strong evidence, but then again, given the, the rough nature of the measure of partisanship, what we found is that um, basically this interaction. So if you're, if you're this is basically sure if you're a Demo, if you were a Democrat who sent one of these requests, and you were in a very Republican county, you were less likely to get a response. But as the county became more and more Democratic, you were more likely to get a response. So again. These aren't really strong findings. I'll show you the subs, um, um, substantive significance um, in a second. It's not big movement, but it, you know, again, I was pretty surprised, to be honest, when we found this result in so far as county vote share is a, a fairly rough proxy of this. And so, um, which I guess is what I just said. And so if you consider a Democrat white mayor who submits his information from an extremely Democratic county, 73% Clinton vote share, the probability of response was 78%. Whereas if you think if that same person wrote to an extremely conservative county where there was a 24% Clinton vote share, the probability of response was 73%. And so again, it's not a huge effect. It's about a 5% drop in response rate, which is actually similar to what these guys found in their study of partisan discrimination in job markets. Um, and so in that sense, there seems to be a, a similar effect size in terms of this partisan spillover and these types of, of, of requests. Um, so, and again, I don't want you to kind of distract you though. When we add these interactions and do these things, the racial threat finding remains very robust. So that's not disappearing. So I don't want people to forget. That's really the major thing that we found in these studies. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So just a few other details. Um, the average, just in case you're interested, the average time to respond was about three days. Um, um, it's, it, you can't do a lot with that in terms of data from an experimental standpoint because basically, you no longer have the random assignment because everybody who didn't respond is no longer in the data. So what you have to do in that case is you have to make some presumption about the non-responders. So like, for example, we could assume that they responded at the maximum number of days where we stopped looking at the data. And if we do that, we don't really find any effective experimental conditions. We couldn't find, no matter what we kind of assume, there was no experimental component that seemed to affect how long it took people um, to respond. We also content analyzed the content of the responses. Um, we coded for the mention of follow-up opportunities, like give us a call, um, give us contact information, which is what we asked for. Um, you can come and visit our campus. And then we also coded if there was engagement with the requests. So for example, did they talk about, if you recall, um, we mentioned the person was active in theater, did they talk about theater opportunities? Or if they mentioned politics, did they talk about politics? 94% suggested a follow-up, so, which is not that surprising insofar as we asked for that follow-up information. So given that high number, obviously there is nothing going on across experimental conditions. Only 20% engaged in the particulars, which suggests that most of them were, were sending kind of what JF would send, which is just this kind of basic response that's kind of made for anybody. Um, 
if, and again, in looking at the data of the people who actually did engage in the particular, if we assume the non-responders to the email at all did not engage, we don't find any change of engagement. So it wasn't, we couldn't find any evidence that they were more engaging with certain types of requests or mention of politics. So in content, we didn't find anything um, that was particularly intriguing. Um, so to summarize, um, the racial threat dynamic. So what we, the main finding really is that there's no discrimination against a non-political African American prospective student, but as soon as he makes a reference to politics, discrimination becomes apparent, and it's consistent with the study that I mentioned before that I had just come across that an African American requester who mentions caring about anti-racism or and racial injustice receives fewer responses um, as well. Um, so partisan discrimination, we found slight evidence of partisan discrimination. We, um, regarding democratic requesters. Um, so here's, so I'm going to try to briefly mention this without generating a ton of conversation. So I wanted to get back, so we did not look at HBC schools in particular, so we could do that. Um, I think it's a really good idea. And so, another quick question. Yeah. Did you send the emails at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did the same study with requests for PhD information from social science programs. And so, this was to any social science program, so it was political science, sociology, anthropology, um, public policy, economics. Um, we basically got a list from the National Research Council in the United States. Um, and this was actually, this. well, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but this, we didn't do this at the same time, in part because I had a lot of ethical struggles on if this was something I was comfortable doing. Um, <laughs> so were actually like, right, you guys, if you were in the US, could have been JF, you could have been in the study as the director of graduate admissions um, if you had been in the in the U.S. Um, well, we did it, um, and so um, and so we so um, and I felt so 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 I well I'll show I we have not looked at these data very carefully. All all I can show you is the percentage of response by condition. So it was the same design, the same general condition. Um, and here I I think it's actually a good question um, about the realism. I, mean, I didn't query. Kind of director of graduate admissions of how realistic it would be to mention this or not. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so that was what it looked like. So what we found, we didn't find the same thing. Um, we found, it's hard to look at the table. So we found a democratic bias. Um, so if you look at the white Democrat or the African American Democrat, those are significantly higher than the non-political or the politically engaged. And so there's some, if, we, if I put up the same regression, you would see a significant coefficient on the democratic response. And so it looks like there's a little bit of a democratic bias in the likelihood of respond. People were more likely to respond when the person mentioned being involved with Democrat. Um, but um, we also, which I'm still trying to make sense of this, this just plummets, right? Um, and so if you get a white, uh, I'm sorry, an African-American Democrat or a politically engaged African-American, that this, this goes up versus the white Democrat. So there's no racial threat in the same sense that we found in the other data. But here we're seeing this, an African-American Republican seems to be threatening of, of some sense. So I, 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 you know, literally was just looking at these data less than a week ago. So I'm still trying to make sense of it. I, I asked a psychology colleague of mine who studies racial threat, and um, this was a quote from her paper. So she, of course she sent me to her paper and said, oh yes, I could have predicted that. Um, <laughs> we all do that, right? So um, you see, her claim is that the, like, people are, are um, they're, they're, they're averse to interracial content that might threaten their egalitarian identity. So they were worried about interacting with a minority who might hold a distinctly different political perspective. Um, maybe. Um, it's one possibility. So again, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah. Is it possible that some of your uh, admissions officers were black or African American themselves? It is certainly possible. So maybe, maybe they're the ones who were particularly. Well, but it would have been randomly assigned across conditions. So we're presuming that that would have washed out, kind of, in terms of any differences across conditions. Um, but, but but you're saying in this condition in particular, they would have been particularly sensitive. I would um, think so. Yeah. So yeah, that's possible. Wouldn't you need to also control for the culture? For the democratic culture? Yeah, we have yeah, those data. I haven't yeah, run that yeah, yet. I don't know if those data are going to be as important insofar as these are faculty, and faculty do tend to be liberal um, in the United States. So when people have done faculty, so these are these are likely faculty members. But we, we actually, I do have the data by county, and it's all set up to go. So I actually, um, we could run that. I could run that 
the five minutes after I, I finished, which is not that Because it was really hard to get the vote share data, but you do have that. <coughs> so yeah, so I, I think that's actually a really interesting suggestion. Um, so that we actually could go back and kind of look. In this case, we in this case, unlike the undergraduate case, we actually do know exactly who the person is. So we actually could go back and, and, and code for that. Um, so it's a really good thought. Um, because that could, that could certainly be driving it. Because I, I assume there's a non-trivial number of minority um, admissions directors. Um, so I wanted to put that up. Maybe that's not a good idea to put something up and then not want to talk about it a lot more, but it's kind of an intriguing thing um, in a parallel study. And I think to some extent we're finding this, some possible racial threat dynamic possibly. And so the kind of implications for the study of discrimination, we see these two major trends, um, increased polarization and democratic shifts. Um, and then we see this increased study, we see as a discipline in partisan discrimination and racial discrimination um, in response to kind of these trends. And I think our point um, is to consider partisan discrimination in higher, one point is to think about partisan discrimination in higher education settings. And so a lot of it, I've not seen an affect of polarization study, for example, just looking at college settings. And so I think that would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, and then our main point, obviously, is, is the kind of attention to the intersection of partisan and racial discrimination. And so we see these two literatures kind of developing and people are looking at them and even comparing them to one another. But we're suggesting that we need to also look at the intersection of them. Um, it's a specific application of racial threat theory. Um, and right to the extent this is happening, it's really leaving minorities in a double bind, right? Because they're being discriminated on, on an intersectional identity. So they're, they face, face possible um, racial discrimination, but then they might face additional discrimination if they happen to be political, um, which introduces all kinds of, of problematic issues for, for a democratic um, functioning. Um, the implications for a higher education, it's difficult, it, again, it's difficult to know the extent to which these responses are really impactful, um, <coughs> but there's much debate about political bias in academia on, on campus, and I think there's insufficient study of political discrimination in um, college settings, and again, looking at this intersection, I think is particularly something that, that people can do more of. Um, and I think higher education is a point where we need to do this more. Um, it's a point of political socialization. Um, people are getting socialized at about the point of higher education. Um, and um, in contrast, this is a really intriguing finding too, in contrast to racial tolerance, where higher education always needs some more tolerance. Um, there was a paper that showed that in terms of partisan effect of polarization, higher education actually makes for more polarized people. So to some extent, the more educated you're getting, it seems to have the inverse effect in terms of partisan discrimination, which makes it perhaps even in a more important context to study. And so just to finish up with a few open questions. Um, so there's no evidence <coughs> of, a, of, of a direct effect. Oh, so there's a typo. Um, um, sorry. So um, due to increased polarization of demographic changes. Um, so I, again, as I kind of pointed out at the start, I don't know anything about the trends. Have these trends had any effect on different types of discrimination in the cells that have changed over time? Um, there's no evidence from our study on the mechanisms. Are people actually stereotyping politically engaged minorities? Are they actually feeling threat? Is it conscious or unconscious? I can't answer those questions. I, I think they're important questions to address, probably not in an audit design study. Um, there's no evidence for a communication such as Trump's tweet um, that activates racial threat. But could a tweet like that activate some kind of racial threat? How do people react to that? Um, what communications can find discrimination? I think is obviously an important thing, given the implicit nature of a lot of these types of communications. Um, under what? Conditions to distinct types of discrimination occur, and then of course uh, the big question, which I think there's no clear answer to, is how do we go about ameliorating um, the discrimination, um, and how do we do that? It's either understudied, it's certainly <coughs> understudied in partisan discrimination, um, and it's certainly under-tested kind of in all kinds of discrimination. And so I'm going to end with that. I probably went on for too long, so thank you very much. <laughs> Two other possible interactions. Sure. Um, one with region, I would expect the racial threat effect to be stronger in the south. And the second one would be um, the type of school, whether I would expect the weaker effect in tier one schools, given that the impression to be more diverse. Yep. Very good, very good suggestion. Thank you.
So that's a, it's a bit of a comment that very well. I mean, that actually, so that's not broken down. So you're correct. So politically engaged very well, actually, you can be a Democrat, Republican, or just politically engaged. So it's not in there. So it's, it was a bit deceiving how I presented it. Because ultimately, the hypothesis is about we're averse to talking about politics at all. And so um, it's not, yeah, it's not. Is that, is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it, because you broke it down in the second one, I'm just curious yeah. about the mean response rate by Democrat Republicans oh. politically engaged for the first. Yeah, so there were no, we didn't find variations in that, but there wasn't a particular okay. rendition that was. So the, reason, the reason I'm thinking about it is that I wonder if it's just a, if you're getting some sort of credibility back here where uh, you saw it much stronger in terms of graduate admission. So somebody, you, know, you received an email saying, you know, I'm a young black Republican. And we know that 90% plus of African Americans in the states are Democrats or vote Democrat. And so you're an admissions officer, you go, oh, okay, this is this is an audit study, but this is something where I'm, I'm worried that, that somebody is just probing my, my bias, so I'm just not going to, I'm not going to engage with this. And so I wonder if you see anything like that in your first in your first study as well. I would find it unlikely in the first study that people would know that that was possibility going on. I, I think it is possible in the second study. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean I suppose I could email back. Yeah, I was trying to think through how you could possibly so, do that. Yeah. 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 Good point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, we do it. nearly everybody names the person. So they nearly all say hello, Jabari, hello, no. No, the auto response is good, but yeah, most of them, so it seemed like most of the people were actually looking at the email and probably likely pacing in a, a common response they but they took enough to personalize the response, so, which is not surprising insofar as. I think all these schools know that personalization is an important part of, um, like when I got the email, you mentioned my son before, it said my son is named Jake, and I was CC as a dear Jake. And I think if it was just a dear perspective student, it wouldn't have had that effect. So, so yeah, they mostly said. Um, they okay, and uh, my second question is, can you control for the reputation of, uh, I guess, for the second one, of the department? Because that, can you speak louder? Okay, sure. I, I'm wondering if you can control for the reputation of the department. Uh, yeah. Or something that they do in the second one, because I just looked back at past emails that I sent to you, to your and others <laughs> when I was inquiring of the PhD program. And it seems that I selectively decided who to reveal my political activity to and who not to. So, People I thought were sympathetic. <laughs> People I thought would be sympathetic. I said uh, I worked on Justin Trudeau's uh, leadership campaign. People <laughs> who I like, decided that he won't be sympathetic. I yeah. said uh, I worked on a political campaign, but I haven't revealed yeah. any, any. So I I played around with that yeah. in the emails. Uh, so I wonder if you can control because I. I'm pretty sure the way I did I mean, it is I looked at what that department or the individual's views are and selectively chose. Yeah, it might be part of that level. I mean, we can control. I mean, again, we can control for the like the partnership of the county. We can control for the academic reputation of the department. I suppose. I think it would be. I mean, I suppose what we could do is we could send a survey to. I don't know if we're going to do this because it. But I, I, we could. Since we know all the graduate directors have sent this to, we can send them a survey and ask them their political views, and then kind of use that data. That seems to me like I think we get a lot of people angry um, effectively about us to 
but yeah, um, don't fund it. There's a question about the <laughs> Is it possible that <coughs> being politically involved is in, unacceptable unless there is something else? That if, if I were to say that I am involved in politics, but I'm all, also this other thing which is non political, so that it, sort of that's okay. Yeah. I think, so we thought, I think that's a great question and we thought about that. So the reason we put in the other extracurriculars was in part to make it more realistic. Um, and so we felt like the common emails that people were sending. And so what I did in kind of thinking about this was I wrote to the admissions counselor and then I also basically asked my son's friends like what they were writing to schools. And I kind of, and so they were mostly writing, they would list like two or three things they were doing. So, it's not a very scientific way to arrive at it, but um, I think it's a, it's a good question. If you just mentioned politics, you might really feel that that's all your passion about. Like, about the potential effects. Yeah. Yeah. So when was data collection for this, Jamie? Um, it was last spring, the end of the spring, beginning of the summer. I guess I'm wondering if you just to, if you were to retreat to all of the individuals who didn't respond in faculty to a teacher bar. And send a message dropping a post of content, just saying, my name is Jabari Wa Washington. I'm interested in your program using essentially what would be the message you use in, in your, yeah. your rough control condition, number one and number two. Uh, and just seeing if the response rate goes back up. Yeah. Because that might let you isolate that politics is the factor driving yeah. the low response rate. Yeah. You could certainly do that. Um, I have to think through, again, if I'm comfortable doing that, but I think. I mean, it's a great design. I mean, and another design that we consider to use, so there are designs where you send multiple emails, and we opt not for a design that does that insofar as some of these schools, well, with PhD programs, I, I don't, it would have started to look suspicious. Um, you got emails that looked almost identical otherwise. And then some of the colleges were small enough that I don't know how many inquiries are getting, so we can go for that. Right. But your, your design suggestion is a great, from a design view, it's, a, it's an excellent suggestion. Do you expect that? Maybe I just don't do enough education at the end. But do you expect a difference between state and non state universities? For example, uh, UPenn versus uh, uh, Virginia, yeah. or Penn State. Yeah, or University of Michigan and Michigan State University. Yeah. Those are both state fashion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, would you expect some differences? And you, would you, your end be. I, uh, my guess is probably um, it might wash out in the tier one suggestion insofar as there's been such an emphasis amongst a lot of the <coughs> schools. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a big, it's a it's a big, it's a, so we didn't look at that. Um, we certainly could look at that as well. Um, I think what we would really want to look at is to look at each school, which might be a bit logistically hard to do realistically. Look at schools, but look at the extent to which they've had diversity initiatives in their schools. Um, I mean, that would be the idea already. If you do this study where you take a, a sample of schools where you know that there's schools and try to block them on, kind of try to do kind of a match design where you had schools that were pretty much similar. Or actually, the, yeah, because I'm talking through this, sorry, I'm just thinking <laughs> as I'm talking, is to do this on schools that have not had diversity initiatives and then wait until they have the diversity initiative and redo it once they have the diversity initiative. Um, so, but I guess uh, so no, state I don't funded that, university yeah. are more likely to have positive discrimination or uh, diversity programs. But that would be the mechanism. Yeah. Not much. Sure. Yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I know this is connected to what Jeff was saying, but I don't think the credibility of the findings depends on the selection mechanism. You really got to choose, you know, whether you can find. The email address on the website, or whether you have an email address in the form, or whether you know, that university responds or not. And I think it would be interesting just to you know, give more credibility to show that in various aspects that would influence the response rate, just to have some kind of balance between the two groups. That would be just getting data for the whole users. Of, of, of yeah. You know, I, I was thinking about something like. You know the amount of scholarships and yeah. all, um, a university gives, so that could have some kind of influence on the probability of getting a response. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, we could do that. I mean, I guess, I guess, I'm, I guess, to the extent that we're interested in generalizing this result into specifically higher education responses to information requests, and I think that's interesting. I don't know how much that's what's driving me here, though. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. Um, yeah. So I, I think the. The major point is, yeah, we have to be careful in generalizing this to four-year colleges in this particular request. I'm, I, I'm viewing this more as a nature of studying and decision making here. Yeah. Uh, okay, so speaking of generalizing, uh, so you mentioned kind of offhand that you're only using male names. Right. And that this is sort of fits with the existing literature of only studying males. And so I guess I have a kind of two meta, kind of meta questions. Yeah. Uh, so first is just, you know, why do you feel so comfortable kind of participating in this tradition of only producing knowledge that's concerned with the male experience? Uh, and then the second question, more related to the framing of this paper, is why do you and your co-authors feel so comfortable projecting the male experience of the human experience? Because you don't talk about, like, this is the effect of, you know, getting an email from a Republican male. You talk about how this is the effect of getting an email from a Republican. Yeah, I mean, I guess... Our rationale for using the male only names is we, we thought we might want to compare the size of the effects that kind of went to the comparing size of the effects we found with other literature. And to the extent that we can do that, if we had very, if we started to use female names, the effect size might not be comparable. So we, we wanted to be able to compare the size of what we were finding to the size of other other literatures um, that had written on these topics before. Um, so that was why we opted to do that. I guess because we this is the first study in this domain that we were aware of. And so we felt like understanding the size of this effect was interesting, was important to us. Um, in terms of us generalizing, um, I mean, I guess, I guess I would put that back on you to make a case on why you would think that particularly the kind of racial threat dynamic that we found would not carry over and generalize. You see, but then you, you must sort of worry that it doesn't Translate the same way among females because otherwise, could you just use one male name and one female name? But then you wouldn't do that because you assume there might be a difference. But if I use one, so if I use the female name and a, and a white male, male name, male exactly. name, right? But then any findings I found, I wouldn't know if it was kind of white. So and that's I, what I mean is that there, there is concern that there's a difference by that. Right, but, you're, but I mean, I guess you're coming to me and saying you can't generalize your findings because you didn't have women. Names and I guess I get the comments a lot on people that say, "Well, you can't generalize the finding." And I guess my feeling is, you know, the, I can shift the burden back on you. Why doesn't my finding generalize to women? Like you tell me what the dynamic is. No, no, so I had a I had a reason within my study for the in terms of the validity of the study that I wanted to keep the, the names comparable. If I started to vary the gender, and then suddenly any finding I found, I'd be varying two things in the treatment. No, no, I, I understand, so, but that's that's what I'm pointing to. It's you know, a reasonable, like a reasonable person might believe or might be concerned that there's a different, also might be a difference by gender. Right. And so, and so I'm not saying, and I'm not saying this is something wrong with the study in particular. I'm just wondering if you could maybe interrogate a little, a little with kind of like participating in this production of knowledge that only looks at. Would you see a replication of this? You know, somebody right. else doing a replication of this using some kind of a female name. Right. I mean, I think that would be what yeah, that's you're probably in terms too. of advancing the knowledge. Is that you have this study and you have someone could replicate it for you. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And more generally, kind of in this literature, to start to look at women names and not just men names. Yeah, but but also if you look at studies that would do that, then that person has to talk about, oh, this is the effect of you know female Republicans. Like, but if you only use female, well, I don't know if they have to do that. Okay. I mean. I'm not, you know, I guess I'd have to see somebody who's impressed to do that. If anything, I guess we would expect a higher effect for uh, minority women, right? Uh, I mean, given the, the literature of discrimination. But, okay, that's, uh, I guess, more. Yeah, I mean, insofar as, you know, but, politics is a male domain that you would expect. Because it's a counter stereotype, right. I, I think, and that's actually part of the. Thing. But I guess the question would be, you would expect less response politically to a woman, period, if it's a male domain. But what would be the intersection of race and gender in politics? 
there's an even bigger assumption that she would be Democrat. So I think getting the letter from a Republican black woman. Right, that's, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, but I think the combination of politics and women is the unusual part. And I think, and so this is actually one of part of my comment before you raise this issue, uh, because I think it's a counter stereotype, right? I mean, so young people are known not to be active in politics. More generally, we are all worried about young people not caring about politics and so on. And so here is this letter. Coming. So uh, I'm, I'm a little bit with Henry on that, like uh, that, uh, you know, it, it kind of uh, brings in this kind of counter image of, of a young person that we have of young people today. So obviously, you're, you're playing with this uh, and you find the effects uh, and so on. But I, I think that kind of in itself is issue, I think, it's a counter stereotype. Um, and then I, I think your results are actually in, in a way good news for polarization, right? Because you don't see so many differential effects uh, based on Republicans and Democrats. I know there is this one county level effect right. that you are talking about, but in general, you don't see, uh, you know, that uh, Republicans or Democrats are generally uh, being discriminated and I think that's actually good news and in terms of how you frame the study right. I, I think it's actually not so much a confirmation uh, that polarization really plays into this kind of process and so I wanted to point that out and uh, I, I have two other variables I think that uh, might be interesting to tap into although probably hard to get which is uh, maybe somebody mentioned this before the racial composition of of the school, if it's easy, easily uh, documented in the database um, that you are getting, I think could could matter. Uh, as well as this is really harder, uh, the political activity on campus, whether the campus is known for its political activity, and where you would expect uh, more tolerance, uh, and therefore this tolerance could carry over all the information. I mean, should it be a racial composition? Yeah, yeah. And so in your in the regression, the first uh, two will be presented. So that's why I understand you combine the uh, sort of uh, involved in politics with the Democrats and the Republicans in that into one that interaction. Yeah. And when, when you separate them, you sort of uh, so yeah, it's got a negative point. <laughs> but if every if you take them separately, every line is significant in your model, or it's just yeah, because yeah. they're virtually end up in almost the same percentages. I, you know, but I, I just for the sake of demonstration, I would keep them separate. And I think very powerful that you know you don't find the difference between Republicans and, and Democrats. So it gets me to my sort of question, which I mean, I really think this is a very well done study, and I mean, I, 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 I get the whole contribution, but what I'm bothered with is your conclusion. You know, well, something is going on. I can't talk about the mechanism here. I don't know what's going on. I don't. I can't explain why people are discriminating on the inter, uh, intersection of of, of, of jet, I mean, race and uh, and political activity. Uh, so you know, I, and uh, when what I but I want to hear more from you is what are you going to write in your I mean, you're going to have written your thesis yet, but you're going to have to address the issue in your paper to piggyback maybe on your hypothesis at the beginning uh, because you presented a bunch of uh, literature and saying, well, uh, sort of like a political activity is one aspect of it, and then and demos, you know, an outgroup, an in group, and whatnot. So, what do you think is going on in the mind of people who are there making that kind of decision? Like, you know, one and if, if this is your control, I mean, your, your treatment, and then, so are they seeing them as troublemakers, or, you know, they're actually I penalized more than, it's a combination of the paper, a combination of personality and race that sort of triggers something into these, uh, these, these mission officers, and I want to know what it's 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, I think there's an issue with these kinds of studies insofar as you can't delve into the psychological mechanisms. I mean, I guess I could have been less open and kind of just say it's racial threat, it's consistent with racial threat hypothesis, and people are being threatened. Um, but it's that's a possibility. Is this a combination? No, no, but the racial threat hypothesis, and so maybe I should have been clear, the racial threat hypothesis is specifically that it's the mention of the mix of race and all of this. And so it's consistent with that. I guess my, my hesitation in saying that was because the alternative to me is that you don't really, I don't know if people are really feeling threatened in this case or if they're just stereotyping. Um, so I, 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 I appreciate your comment because I should be more clearer and, and kind of forceful about those possible um, mechanisms. I can't distinguish between the two. Um, yeah. I think looking at gender would help you get at that mechanism. Because <laughs> because if it's the if it's the threat, then they should be less threatened by the black woman, right? But if it's stereotyping, then they should be more. Yeah, I mean, more I, I think if it was stereotyping, you would. I mean, more two very gender. different dynamics intersecting with gender, and which is I think why I was having trouble kind of thinking through these different possibilities of what you get if you got gender and fashion. Even I'm thinking in terms of stereotype. I mean, in terms of threat, you feel less threatened, perhaps. In terms of, I mean, I have to think more. I mean, the stereotype of an African American woman is a very distinctive stereotype in the U.S. Um, I haven't thought through about what it means to kind of introduce politics. So that's, it's kind of a uh, hopeless, you know, minority woman. Yeah, I, I have to think more about it. But, yeah, and I think this will be the last word. <laughs> I'm sorry because it's only seven minutes past. Deadline, but <laughs> I know that you have paper points, so, so that I will hope that you will you know, enjoy your fight back. So, some of us have to go bowling as well, so we have different you know, responsibilities. Thank you so much for a very, very interesting talk. Thank you. A lot, a lot of questions that I think I was to be on Friday afternoon. So, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Et tout de suite après, il y, aura, il y a du vin et ensuite de la nourriture.